we headed on to the road leading up to the Urupa. There are human bones everywhere in this corner of Waikanae and Kanakana, south of the river. It's rich with history, a site of numerous ceremonies and the place where many stories of the Kapiti district originate. The El Rancho camp itself is a cherished asset to the community and the people who use this space value its special atmosphere. On the road to the Urupa, we looked across to where some residents had tied helium balloons on long strings. They had been at the Waikanae station protest that morning and the balloons show the height of the motorway lights that anyone living around here can expect to see all night. There would be more balloons to greet us when we finally arrived at Timoana Road. The green line shows our route up to the Urupa, and the red line shows the old cart route, used to bring bodies for burial back in the old days. The Western Link Road was designed to head west of the tree and cut around the back of the Urupa by the glass houses. This would unfortunately disturb some sensitive land in a sacred spring. The autobahn, though, would cut directly between the Makatu tree and the Urupa and destroy the historical hill and the cart track used by burial wagons last century. Logistically, it would have to be several metres above the swamp. This area of land between the river and Timoana Road is very low-lying in parts, as low as two metres above sea level, and even in summer, parts of it feel like walking across a waterbed. What would building a motorway through here be like? Some people dispute climate change, and that's understandable, but unfortunately not wanting climate change won't make it go away. Professor Martin Manning of the Climate Change Research Institute of Victoria University explain. I, I got involved in helping to run the, um, the last assessment of what we know about climate change for governments that uh, ran from 2002 to 2007. And um, in, towards the end of 2007, um, we were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for this. And I think it was part of a recognition that all the scientists coming together um, and trying to really be objective about what they know and what they don't know is becoming widely recognised. It's increasingly important. The science doesn't know all the answers, but we can point generally in the, in the way in which we have to start dealing with things. And there are risks. Yeah, you might not want to believe it, and a lot of people don't, but um, I would say now that one of the reasons they're going to start having to shift that position is we're seeing major companies around the world shift and the reinsurance industry which is the stopgap for all our insurance policies in, in the world they have started to take a much stronger line now on adapting to climate change and this year for example over a hundred of the major companies um, signed up an agreement with the United Nations Environment Programme um, <clears throat> they're, they're, they're recognizing that we're not doing enough about risk management we're seeing some of the huge banking organisations and investment organisations dealing with literally trillions of dollars now recognise that they're going to have to start shifting that money into new technology to reduce climate change. Uh, but even so, you know, we're still going to have to deal with a lot more climate change this century than we've seen in the past. So it's something that when you're planning for what you do on your coastline, you've got to be more risk averse than we have in the past. I mean, th there are areas um, just to, you know, set back from the beach uh, around Waikanae um, that have obviously not been developed because they are low-lying and they have swamps and they have you know, water, water lakes and things like that sitting there and the ducks love them. Um, but the question becomes now, well, how will they be affected by sea level rise? They're not very high above sea level. And what's more, you've got to think about how the connection between um, the water coming down uh, and the water coming up um, from different, 
different perspectives, and is it going, is it going to meet in some of those places? So I think the land, there's quite a lot of land that's only about two meters above sea level, and shifting a road down to that area needs to be thought about pretty carefully. As the planet starts to change more and more rapidly, it means that we have to think very carefully about how we use the environment. And the big issues I think that have emerged in science in the last 10 years are sea level rise and coastal management. So when we're thinking about a huge major investment that's structural around the northern part of the Wellington region, going up through the Cavity, Cow Cavity Coast area, it really means we have to think differently. Um, we have to be much more risk averse and much more careful. It's puzzling that the intention to build State Highway 1 through Transmission Gully is well inland and up higher, but they want to do the opposite in Kapiti, move State Highway 1 closer to the sea and certainly closer to sea level. And it will be through a higher risk area for earthquakes than the current State Highway 1. Enlightened governments, dealing with the sea level rise and increasing storm surges, do a thing called managed retreat. When you build costly infrastructure, you reduce the risk by making sure it's safely inland and higher up. So instead of managed retreat, Mr Joyce and his friends are planning what we'd like to call mismanaged advance. And they plan to shift New Zealand's number one highway inland at Transmission Gully as a secure passage to and from Wellington City in the event of a major earthquake. Safety first, that they want to build the next section of the highway north of Transmission Gully at Mackay's to Pekapeka before Transmission Gully. How come? So the great stream of Wellington motorists gushing from Transmission Gully won't get stuck at Kapiti? Yeah, right. That problem's easily sorted with the Western Link Road and fixing up the highway. And there's a host of other smart, modern solutions. How much of the total north-south traffic would you expect it to handle if completed? Two-thirds? Three quarters? Well, we obtained information at one of the NZTA expos. We really had to press them hard for it. What was it? The study showed that, at most, the Sandhills motorway would take a half of the total north-south traffic. Most likely, about a third. And the current State Highway 1, which Nathan Guy promotes as our substitute for the Western Link Road? That would still be left as it is, to cope with the majority of through traffic. What if they run out of money? You know, it's possible they could run out of money halfway through the job. Just to move a gas pipeline is estimated at 50 million, did they factor that into their original costings? And what would we be left with? We left the Urupa and made our way to the north end of the Wahitapu area. Here we're descending down the hill onto the flat near Osborne Swamp. It's only two metres or so above sea level and will probably become mangroves one day. People who settle around here and at the beach enjoy the marine sounds and the atmosphere. It's peaceful. Many retired folk have decided to live here for tranquility and peace of mind. One meaning of Waikanae is placidity or serenity. That's why people choose to live here. Some people are already having their health seriously affected by the stress. One of the main concerns is the noise factor. Motorways are noisy. That's a fact of life. But people come to live here to be away from noise. Here we choose the birds and the trees, please. That's what this place is about. It's known around New Zealand for it. Even Aucklanders come here for the peace and quiet. They know the effect that motorways can have on districts. Auckland is hailed internationally as an example of poor transport planning, and the same thing happened there in the 1950s as the current government plans for Kapiti. Reduced public transport and more big roads. Just look how successful Auckland's massive motorways have been in solving traffic congestion. Mark's showing us where the Sandhills Motorway, or Kapiti Autobahn, would intersect with Tamoana Road. There's still a few balloons left, and a local resident took this footage of the earlier excitement for us. Near the Melt Cafe, the balloons you can see flying around are tethered at somewhere near 9 metres. It's going to be the height of the road at 5 metres, and then lighting at 9 metres. Coming on all along this way, taking out a new cafe that's opened Melt, taking out the Margaret Garden, taking out a number of homes here, my home, my next door neighbour, three more houses down. And each one of these balloons, every one of these balloons represents a family 
whose lives are being destroyed by this monstrous road, motorway, which they're looking to put to our Carpathy community. The group finally made it to the north end of stage one of the Western Link Road and we said our farewells. So here we are then. The Carpety Autobahn is unwanted and it's a waste of money. This government's own report, which they tried to hide, shows the Carpety Expressway has a benefit cost ratio, BCR, of 0.6. This means that the benefits gained from it will generate only a 60 cent return for every $1 spent to build it. It's a money waster. <laughs> 